Last week, when we were chatting about um, the executives on culture, we then said the next challenge was going to be data literacy. And this relates also to the skills. Um, so I did some research and you will find uh, quite, a bit, quite a bit of this comes from Click. I think they've been doing um, the most research. There were, there's another program that was on and they keep on talking about the masters of data literacy and the, and the, interestingly enough, the guy that runs the data literacy program in Click is considered to be one of the thought leaders of data literacy and when one can certainly see why. So when I looked at the key findings, um, these, this, this was quite interesting to say that enterprise-wide data literacy is low. 24% of business decision makers uh, are fully confident in their, in their ability to read, work with, analyze, and argue with data. Um, 24%. So, and it's been quite an amazing journey. Almost, we started talking about this with uh, Dominique um, sometime, almost about eight months ago, and we started having chats about the data literacy. We got in, we had some of these chats. We, I did my first literacy assessment. I was a little bit embarrassed about my score, but um, you'll you'll see it for yourself as well as we as we do it. Okay, so 24% is really low. Senior leaders do not display confidence. That I can relate to. 32% are. Uh, of the C-suite is viewed as data literate. Um, and so what we're talking there is is 68% of the C-suite can then be assumed to be data illiterate. And, and I know when I talk to C-suite execs, they don't like that term. Um, <laughs> when we talk about data literacy, that confidence and, and just that being caught out is, is quite embarrassing. So. Um, I think some cases we have to change that term because uh, people don't always like the, the consequence of not being illiterate or not being literate. Uh, future em employees are underprepared for data-driven workplaces. We know that. Um, this is something that we've been trying to work with in terms of business schools, uh, universities, is, is to up the level of data management or data literacy. And and I always find this to be a debate with them. When when we go in there, they will argue with me that data literacy. They got all the data science programs and things like that. And so why why do I consider them to be uh, in a, ineffective? Um, and and I've had some difficult discussions trying to convince them. I don't believe I've convinced too many of that requirement. But what I have found in several universities is almost a data management course for researchers. Uh, and that was that was pretty amazing. The, the course, I really liked the course that was done there. And then I also relate to some of these universities when I went to go and speak to a prof about um, looking after the uh, shot hole borer. Do you guys know some of that in terms of the trees, the, that fungi that's attacking the trees in mainly in Johannesburg? Um, and we were we went to the prof who studies this fungi, and we asked him how we were going to do it year on year. And he said, no, no, he's just going to walk around, and they'll take a quick photograph of the tree. And I said, so are you, are you now 100% sure that you can enable that this tree is the same one as you measured last year? Because they want to see the growth of the fungi. And... He said, no, no, don't worry about it. It's not a problem. And I said, oh, that's interesting. And, and we went and had a look at some of the GPS coordinates and they were completely wrong. And, and they had no clue about master data management. So they were unable to, and they didn't recognize the, the requirement to make sure that that tree is the only tree and almost a golden record for that tree. That didn't, you know, he wasn't, even, wasn't aware of it. So I think it's quite important because these guys get a whole lot of Excel data, they then publish it, and then the next person comes along and starts again. So they, they never have the same tree data every for each doctorate. So interesting. We, we need more of that. Organizations are losing competitive advantage. 
because better data literacy drives higher enterprise performance. Um, and that's an 85%. So <clears throat> that's phenomenal. Um, I, I I must admit, in, in some cases, and I, and I work with econometricians, and they can comfortably say that they don't really trust the statistics, and they uh, what we'll see is data doubters, um, and we'll see that a little bit later on. Data is key to professional credibility. That's we agree with that, uh, and there's an appetite to learn. So people want to learn. It's not as if people are saying, "Oh, shucks, don't worry about it. We we comfortable." People are, are are keen to learn. Any any comments on that from you guys? Have you experienced uh, anything like this in terms of the numbers that that are being presented? So, so on the on the, I think the second one and the first one definitely, Howard. I think the yeah. challenge we've also always seen is there wasn't really there hasn't really been a buy-in. You know, people are talking about data as a strategic asset and all those fancy things and throwing buzzwords around, but there's no no yeah. real investment in terms of people actually skilling up their their workforce force um, on on data literacy on any level. Um, yeah. and, and I've only started to see movement on that in the last few months. Yeah, I mean, and. and I mean, it's phenomenal. They, a lot of people are saying that 4IR is driving this, um, but you know, are are some of the people responding? Um, and I was in a, I was in, because I work for some of the banks. Um, there was one bank that uh, went out to retrench people, and they stated that one of the key reasons for retrenching was 4IR. Um, and then SASPO, the union, turned around and said, uh, uh, do me a favor. We allocated something like 15 million rand to the CETAs to train people for 4IR, and you haven't used a cent. So why is it that you can retrench people and the retrenchment was, was put on hold? So interesting, interesting uh, obligation that we have to train our people. I believe this should become part of the data governance program. Um, and I know certainly telecom's doing it. How many are you, how many other people that are on the data governance side have this data literacy program running? Any, anybody else got data literacy running? I'm also part of telecom, so. Oh, okay, yeah. Jess, you can you can ride on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so so we got okay, so we really got one one company that's operating. I know that um, one of our strategic themes for one of the customers on the I strategy is uh, this education. So that's coming along, but we we've got a way to go. Okay, great. So what is the definition? Um, I, I've changed this slightly. So there you saw previously, it's the ability to read, wrangle, analyze, and argue with data. I capitalized the argue because I think that's probably the most important. Um, if we're feeling weak on our ability to read, uh, wrangle, and analyze, then we'll certainly not argue. And I only start to see confidence in people when they're arguing with the data center, but that's not, that's, that's not what it's saying. It's saying this. Then you start seeing people that are, comp are comfortable in the lower levels. And the other definition is a skill that empowers all levels to ask the right questions, build knowledge, make decisions, and communicate meaning. Um, and there was some interesting stats between those that can coach, those that are capable, and those that are, 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 are still learning. And the coaching, it was on average around about 8% of the population is able to coach um, and, and help people make decisions and communicate meaning. So we've got, we've got a long way to go. All right, so this is the basic thing from Click. Click's got a fantastic uh, body of knowledge that they're building. I wanted to just present this as a straw man. Um, you'll probably have differences there. Uh, the things that I wanted to pick up on was planning and vision that's always there, that's got to be part of your strategy. Communicating what data literacy is, one has to overcome some of those issues. Making, doing an assessment, which we, I'll give you an example of an assessment that we have or that Click put together. 
cultural le- culture learning. This is uh, we did talk about this last week in terms of picking up change management and our culture. Uh, then it's prescriptive learning. Now that's almost what we refer to as your technical learning, and then it's the ongoing measurement. So very simple plan, uh, sort of talk about it, communicate it, um, and then do some assessment in terms of where you're at, do the training, and then start the measurement process. All right. Um, Okay, so we we sort of understand what our literacy program needs to, the shape that it needs to be in. And then I just wanted to, I keep coming back to this knowledge, skills, and competencies. Um, So knowledge is what the prescriptive learning is, okay? Then skills are what are our skill sets for data literacy, okay? And then we have competencies in, in terms of the doing. So what are, what, are, what are the people capable of doing? And that comes into that measurement scenario that, that we saw just now. So if we come back in here, the doing will, will, we will see the evidence of the doing when we start measuring the person's ability to get this right. All right, so there we go. We, we, our program's got to deal with knowledge, skills, and competencies. Um, and <clears throat> so, Zane, that was a question I wanted to ask you before with is, um, do you have a clear definition of your skill sets that you're working on? Have you used yeah. the ones from, okay. Yeah, so, so, so Howard, what we, what we did is we started with, well, it, it's sort of a piggyback of um, initiatives we did before. So in 2014-15, we established a business insights competency center where we established sort of the skill levels across the organization. And right. because we've we've been running that program for about five years, it made sense for us just to sort of piggyback off of those right. definitions because everybody's aware of of what that means. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. So that so that's that's critical. All right. So I just wanted to get some some feedback from you guys in terms of prescriptive learning. So what would you see as data literacy prescriptive learning? What what sort of things would you send your people on? Um, and I hope you picked up on some of the discussions earlier on where we spoke about the universities not really preparing the people for the environment that they're going into. So, well, of course, the universities are doing a great job in terms of, of data science. I think we're seeing a tremendous amount of people that are coming out qualified as data scientists. So... Um, I, I'm not convinced that data science is the, the the set of prescriptive learning. I think it's one element to it, but what what else should we be including in our prescriptive learning? Any any comments from you guys? Well, you can add it on the on the in the interaction. Good, yeah. Okay. Okay, um, so this was, it was a bit of a trick question. I, I sort of put it in here following the knowledge, skills, and competencies, but what, what 
I think is important is until you have a clear understanding of the skill sets, it's a bit hard to describe the or, or to prescribe the learning and the and the training, right? So we have to have and we all have to agree on what our skill sets are, and then and and the things that we're trying to achieve in terms of framework, then we then we put our prescriptive learning down. But I can I can certainly see that some of the answers people have have looked through it and they have this understanding. So one of the questions I wanted to ask you guys is, is your data terminology? Now, I know we talk about a business glossary. How many people have a comprehensive data management dictionary? And if so, where did you get it from? Did you build it yourself? That's a that's a very awkward question, Howard. <laughs> um, so so we, so we have one, we built one, um, and we're rebuilding one again for for the Talcom Group. But it's I would say a 50-50 match, right? So we have the the industry standard definitions, KPIs, and those things that we then list, but then also the the internal sort of verbiage and wiki that we that we bring into it. But it's right. yeah, it's it's sort of guided towards, and I think the biggest challenge I've had for as long as I can remember is every they want to customize everything towards our environment. So it's very difficult to sort of enforce the, the industry standard definitions of things. Right. Um, specifically right. when it comes to data, but yeah, around 50, 50. And, and, and this is, this is where we, where we're going to struggle with our, with our programs because of this, of this undefined data terminology. Um, and so we have to get that common understanding. And I think what what uh, there was always one guy that got me excited about doing a business glossary, and and, and there was one statement that he made. He said, um, "We don't communicate without understanding." So until we have common understanding, he's basically saying we don't communicate. We talk past each other, we talk next to each other, we don't talk and communicate with each other. So there's a critical element to that. All right. Okay, so from a skill set point of view, um, this is this is something that I, I I wanted to just jump through. This is something that um, Click has got in terms of their skill set, and you can see that it's that it's it's this really focusing on the communication um, of data literacy. And then communicating with data, so it's storytelling. Um, they've got, and I like this approach. Um, we call it personas. Uh, other people call it personalities. So, uh, being able when you measure the people, and when we put this assessment for the people, we almost need to know what area they're in, so that we can build their learning path. Right. So the last thing you want to do for a data aristocrat is get him to do the same as a data doubter, right? Because this person will go mad doing the data foundational skills. They've, they've got that. So if you can't position these people properly, you, you're really going to build a learning pathway that they're either going to get bored with or they're not going to enjoy the, the, the process a lot. And, and you're wanting everybody to get on there. Um, and what it's nice to have is is almost identified leaderboards uh, type of stuff where people can see where they're at um, and they can start understanding how to climb up this uh, along the learning pathway. So I wanted to just have a quick um, check with you guys. Uh, this is the, the data literacy assessment program. So if you guys wouldn't mind navigating to that website, it's on the it's on the meeting chat right in the beginning. Um, and I and I wanted to go through with you and then just get a feedback in terms of where you guys are sitting. Um, if you wouldn't mind. So if that's okay with you guys, are you able to to navigate? Um, I'll answer for you. I'm not no, no, I won't answer for you. I will just if you follow me, I'll just answer, and then we'll we'll get the you'll get your your assessment at the end of the day, and then you can share it on LinkedIn if you if you are courageous. Are you ready, Paul? 
I'm ready. Okay. All right. <laughs> Everybody else ready? Is there? Uh, I've, just no dropped it again. I've just dropped it again. Up. In, in, okay, cool. So if you guys wouldn't mind putting your either your hands up or or just on on WhatsApp, uh, and then I know if I know that you're ready. Thanks. Excellent. Danae. Paul, you ready? Okay. Yes. Excellent. So there's just uh, Alberta and, and Danae, but it's not, it's not, if you guys don't want to do it, not a problem. Um, uh, no, Howard, I'm on it. Uh, I just got into the site. It's it's a bit okay. slow. Yes, okay. But I, right. I'm on Thank it. You. Excellent. Right. Okay. So here's the first one. Uh, how do you feel if you were confronted by this scenario? Okay. So please, uh, if you want to copy my answers, that's fine. But you may have a, a, a bad outcome. Okay, so so if you if you just go through it, there are ten questions. That was on the on the actual um, graphs. What's the best description of your experience with data? Um, I like this one. I'm gonna see if I'm, I'm gonna try to see if I get the data. So that was an interesting uh, term that they used. I, I actually quite like this term. Well, <laughs> I, I like the use of the term central tendency. Um, now, if you if you look up on Google, the interesting thing is, I think the term actually came around about the 1960s or 50s, and and it's really just the uh, closeness or the mean or the average that they're talking about, central tendency. So. Um, I haven't heard anybody use that for quite some time. Wow. <laughs> okay. I'm a bit blown away by this. Okay, did everyone make it to the end? Almost. Okay. I get the feeling there's something wrong with this assessment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I don't. I don't feel so happy anymore about my <laughs> my result. <laughs> I think there's a bit of a sales <laughs> thing going on with this thing. Yeah. <laughs> Did anyone get anything else other than the data night? I also got data night. Okay, nice one, Jess. Paul, what did you get, sir? I'm the slow kid, so give me a second. Okay. 
if you wouldn't mind just clicking the thumbs up on this on this thing so I know everyone's back. Ah. Are we all day to nights? Yeah, I think so. Shucks. <laughs> I was oh, a kid. The outlier. Uh, day to night. Day to night. Yay. I was hoping <laughs> for something well different. <laughs> okay. So, Howard, I think there's one one of those fields is definitely the, one of or one of those answers carries quite a lot of weight yes. because I've now gone and yes. taken like the worst one for each one of them, and then I got data dreamer. So it does work, but I think uh, in one of those answers, it instantly sort of makes you a data night if you know the answer. Sure, I'd 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 love to know which one because I yeah I answered the word I th what I thought to be the worst answer for every <laughs> single one. <laughs> okay. So what I was really just showing is, is I like this thing of breaking up the the personalities, um, the data aristocrat. I must have tried five or six times to get that. I I failed repeatedly. Um, so that means you mustn't really listen to me. Uh, <laughs> so this is what they're basically saying. The approach is to uh, develop these employees with enhanced skills in storytelling as leaders and mentors, ensure their training includes leadership. Um, and then we have the day to night approach. Uh, and I think you may have seen this, maybe yours, and then uh, start at the beginning with data dreamers, have them attend a foundational course. And data doubters, again, start with awareness training. So that's almost that, don't even start with training them. You, you need to get the awareness right. Um, so this is sort of what I mapped on this uh, in terms of positioning the, on the learning path. And we always know that we're never going to be 100% correct with leadership and um, mindset and communication. Those things we can always work on. Statistics, we'll always work on coding. But nice to understand what are the important skill sets and, and then the personality mappings. And hopefully we can measure the progress of how many people we've moved through. What I do like about this, and I think this is quite helpful, is it helps you with your change and culture mapping, right? So um, we know that those that are doubters, if we, they are almost what we spoke about our data disabled. So they are resistant to data. They'll never trust data. Um, and the more we get out of this area of data into dreamer slash night, um, the better for the organization. But I think we need to change the assessment that we perform. All right. So if you would mind just adding your, your data personality, I'm, I'm sort of assuming now that everyone's going to be data night except for Zane who got the dreamer, I think. <laughs> You get a special award for, for that one. <laughs> okay. So that's great. So we, we sort of now have a good understanding now in terms of of the skill sets that we require, that we need to focus on. Um, we understand some of the measure or the categorizations of the personalities. Now it gets to the, the trickier part uh, in terms of the competencies, and that's part of the doing. And I like this approach in terms of, of breaking up my learning uh, and understanding where we, we first of all we'll start with understanding data. Um, and so what I'm battling with in terms of click and and some of the other areas, Zane mentioned Calibra, I, I've heard about it, but I haven't seen it. But it's this basic thing of first, first and foremost, can we get people to understand the data? Then 
um, can we get them to be able to search for and find the data that they need to work on? Now, we, we're going to have challenges within our organization in terms of, of allowing them to do that. But let's not worry too much about those challenges. Then it's the reading, interpreting, and evaluating data. So I think when we, when we really get this right, when we go across domain, so I, I, I found a lot of these experiences coming through when I got, um, when I, I've got a, one customer that we going through this on, we got four completely different domains and when they needed to look at other people's data, um, we had this one scenario where it took three months for someone to understand the data that was shared with them from another department. Now, these are highly skilled people from a business point of view to take three months to just read the data, interpret and evaluate the data. That was, it was a shock of and horror when we presented this information to the execs. The COO in particular couldn't believe that it would take us so long to work to get an understanding of the data. Then we go into managing the data and creating using data and data sets. So um, it's a little bit like life cycle management where we get to using and enhancing data. This is the, the end point over there. Um, so I, I found this approach to be more in line with, with what I see as important and especially if we get people to use their own data. It's, it's really hard to concoct just I mean, I've tried this once with with uh, a group of people, and we just use stats essay data using GDP and and stuff like that. And um, I think we had to spend so much time defining what the data meant that that it it got a bit frustrating. But I think there's there's some good experiences there as well. Zane, in terms of, of the way in which Calibra puts it together or the way in which you guys are putting together, is, is it similar to this or something completely different? Yeah, so so my, my learning path is very similar to this, Howard, but, but what I've done is um, I've split it up towards specific competencies. So as we have like our, our um, data stewards, you right. know, either the business data steward or the technical data steward right. to, okay. to create specific learning parts for them. So it's it's so other than that's almost, sort of is that almost your personality. So is that yeah, so, similar yeah, to yeah, your personality? So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so we're looking at the personality and then matching that towards sort of the level of skill set. So there's let's say for instance on this one, um one, two and three we will do for everyone in telecom. Right. And then right. four and five will be specific to to maybe your job role or specification. Okay. I like that, yeah. So, I mean, I, I always, always found that fascinating um, when they categorize data stewards. Uh, and the one category of data steward, I don't know if you guys have seen this, but there's a defining data steward, there's a using data steward, um, and I forget the other two. There was a project data steward that was involved, but that defining and using, basically what they were saying, that not a lot of the data stewards can define data that they need uh, and build a, a almost a data model that represents the data requirements. And then we've got the using data people that are basically on the application. And I think we had the enhancing or the enabling data steward. Um, are those the sort of categories that you're using for your data stewards as well, Zane? Yeah. Yeah, okay. that's exactly it. All right. Okay, great. So this is uh this is, that was the sort of framework that we used now the common barriers uh the sort of, was quite nice in terms of what are the common barriers that you're going to face and you're going to face harder and harder challenges as you progress as you progress up the the stack and where you're also going to find the harder challenges is if you're working across your business units um, how are you going to provide the environment for them to have these doing and learning experiences that that is easy enough to go across the different departments? So you you need to almost sample your data sets. So technically, we've got infrastructure and tools. So this is where I, I keep finding that this is going to be very particular to an organization. Um, 
So if you if you think, oh, that's great, and we use Click, but your current organization is using Power BI or vice versa, you're going to create some some challenges. And I, and, I, and you can see it down the bottom here where you say, if you introduce these people into data-driven tools and methods too quickly, the data is going to remain the data and may go worse. Um, and I always thought you couldn't get any worse, but I've seen seen that go worse, where, where it's completely negative. And then organizational issues, uh, typically only techies speak data and are the keepers of data. And now we have to change that and we have to get get that barrier to, to be relaxed. Um, so this is uh, some of the stuff that I'm also working with in terms of, of this progression. We call it the progression framework. So in terms of understanding data, we need to be able to conduct a, an assessment of the data and I found it helpful to do it their data. And this was fascinating as well. Within the same department, um, uh, we don't have the same definitions. So when we conduct an assessment, there was a bit of a fright within one department on their data. Then when we went to somebody else's data, the, the, the deterioration was phenomenal. Um, Zain, I don't know how, how that relates in terms of, are you seeing that across your departments as well? Yeah, definitely. Sure. It's yeah. it's nerve wracking. Sometimes I, I get quite depressed when you 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 think you're going to take you're going to take these leaps and bounds and it, and it doesn't happen. Yeah. So I think that and this this comes back to our discussion from last week as well. But I think there's sort of a a organizational culture thing where yeah, you know, it's good for us to look at this, but this doesn't really add to the bottom line. So why? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, you're right. Um, and and hopefully, I mean, and it is about creating that business case where they you remember that key findings of 84% uh, of the individuals, I can't remember the exact number of, of what it was saying, but the, being productive in the use of data. So that competitive edge, but the ability to convince the, the execs that that is true when when they are not data literate, there's a problem there, right? So they they're probably going to argue that that problem isn't as big as you're making it out to be, um, on the fear that that they may come up short as well. Okay, so this one was sort of under understood. We've spoken about segmenting our audience. We've spoken about conducting an assessment. We talk about the goals and in terms of the progression. I like this buddy system, or people refer to it as cohorts going up the mountain. Uh, can we get teams of people that will progress and then the tailored training, which is what you have to do. You can't just use standardized training. Um, map your company's data ecosystem. There's there's another mission on all on its own. Um, modernize your approach to data governance. So if we keep on with the control approach to data governance and not the enablement, We'll lock down all the data sets and then people will not be able to find and obtain that data. So part of the problem is that as governance, we, we're creating the lockdown, we're creating the, the funnel, um, and then building the sandbox for people to explore. So how do we create the sandbox environment that people can access it? Now, I don't know about you guys, but I've been learning in the last four months on Snowflake um, and I'm absolutely blown away by it's they've got a, a data set of 60 billion rows and we're currently doing a Power BI assessment on the Snowflake data warehouse, but its ability to in, ingest data, to share data, to make data available without moving the data is something I've never seen before. Um, and that, that's been great. Um, now, they, now, when, when I've sp spoken to other people, they all suggest that um, you use the cloud. Now, I know in some of the customers, it's just a no-go. So you have to find ways of, of creating this environment locally. All right, then we're going to reading and interpreting and evaluating data, uh, teaching people to ask the right questions. That's, that takes some patience. Um, I normally delegate that to Veronica. Um, and then we put data in familiar format. That's also critical. I don't know. Um, I did a talk once on 
the OECD or the open data platform in, in Europe. And one of the biggest hindrances that they've described in terms of sharing of data is uh, unfamiliar formats. So they prescribe a certain number of formats. You can't submit a data set unless it's in one of the familiar formats. I, I wasn't aware of that um, when I started, but it, it, was, so, so it was a bit of a shock to me. So I can really relate to this one of getting it into the right format. And that's going to be CSV, uh, even going down to that level. Um, Excel, sometimes you get it in, in Access and stuff like that, and, and, and you just mission with that thing. But again, Excel is, is probably better than putting it into an Access database or putting it into a SQL Server or Oracle. That just, or even XML. You know, we, we think that people can operate, but we really must have the ability for a guy to basically open Excel, look at the data, and start working with it. Adding business context, there's a glossary coming, building dashboards to visualize, and then we we get into this next level, which is that minimize data extract. You're not going to win if you have to keep on exporting the data. Now, I know Calibra has got this phenomenal thing, and, and IGC as well, where you just say, um, give me the data. So you can do a data catalog, you look at it and say, I want a level of data, and it actually creates an exploratory area. Um, I don't know if any of you guys have got that working, or, and, and it's specifically for the analytics. Um, anyone got the, the data, the automation of data extracts working? Okay. Then the next one is something that's quite exciting that I'm working on uh, with a few companies. Uh, I've got an, an engagement with Altrix in terms of they are saying that they are in, they are battling to sell tools and get people to work with tools because there's no governance around their self-service analytics. And I, I find this to be critical. We we're talking in the in the area of BI slash advanced analytics, but the, the use of self-service BI analytical tools to, to perform that. Um, Zane, do you have something like that set up specifically for self-service? Jess, do you know uh, Zane may be on a call? Um, I'm not aware of any anything in terms of self-service. I could be wrong. I'm relatively new. Okay, um, okay. But not as far as I know. Anybody Sorry, else? guys, I just missed that one. What was the question, Howard? Yeah, this one was, this is something that I've been working on in the last two, three months in, in providing a governance framework for self-service analytics. Yeah, so we, we're pushing self-service BI at this stage, which yes. depends on what the definition is of analytics. So the, uh, the data yes. science right. stuff we, we're working towards, but I mean, it's from a self-service BI perspective, quite heavy in the SMB space um, where we, well, so what we effectively do is we standardize the data set, we add the definitions into it, we effectively then lock it and right. then add that data set to, to a Power BI sort of template so they can go and build the right. dashboards, but all of them use exactly the same data. Yeah. Okay, so so basically you, you, you've got curated data and then you're yeah. providing Power BI templates and they can work with it, but how far have you gone in terms of the governance framework? So, so governance on that side is it's it's quite far. Um, I think the next one that we're busy tackling is is BCX, but the biggest challenge there is just the sheer amount of of data, and they haven't really looked right. at sort of combining okay. it. So there's it's sort of starting from scratch again. But okay. but on the SMB side of things, we we're doing well. Um, and then for the broader telecom, yeah, I think we we're a few years off. <laughs> um, okay. We're not we're not going to get there. Sure. Before twenty twenty four. Five, I think. <laughs> okay, but but I, what I have found helpful is is really just to build a framework specifically for self service. So it's really about managing uh, what decisions are are a what what can we use self service for and what can't we use self service for. Um, and initially, we got lots of scares on on people saying, "Oh, but you're creating a regulatory report that you're sending to the regulator." Um, from a from a self service platform, and so there were some challenges there in terms of 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 that. So interesting to start talking about that. Um, so that we they we spoke about pre joined data sources. 
other people call it curated data sets, but I believe that's what what um, Zane was talking about. Uh, and then sharing, this ability to find data sets. Uh, so the classification of all your data. Now, when I use the word classification, I'm not just talking about the security side of it. That That needs to come in, but it's also contextually what part of the business, what business subject area does this data come from and allowing you to search for tags or keywords from your business glossary that these data sets have been added to and they can then find the appropriate data sets. Any, any comments on that? I would so, so maybe on that point, um, and it's something we've been struggling with for a while, is, 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 is taxonomy or taxonomy still a thing? Um, yes. I know it still, yes. it still helps with classification, but I think that's we've been looking at it for a while, and obviously it's going to take yeah. some time to get it classified. But it it resolves a lot more issues when when yeah, we yeah. sort of bring the data together in you know in, in specific groupings and using a proper yeah. taxonomy model would, would typically be a step in the right direction. I think. Hundred percent. You, you and it's you must look at what we refer to as a multifaceted taxonomy. Okay, yeah. so within yeah. a classification, you have different facets, one facet being security, one facet being your business context, uh, other, facet, other facets in terms of sharing and things like that. Um, and, and so there's, there's a lot that goes on there. And, and that's very exciting in terms of creating a, a proper searchable environment that can people can come at it from all different angles. And you've got to have the right level of tagging. But, but these days, you when when you have those data sets and you have the data dictionary, you can then do a mapping of your data dictionary to your taxonomy, which is fantastic. Um, and STMX has got some fantastic examples of how they do this within that within that standard. So um, take a wider view of data classification. Don't just be restricted by the the security guys on on oh, it's just for security. We can get a tremendous value out of that because it's not all hierarchical. But you you will have so you'll have security, privacy, uh, and all the other areas. I can show you a video diagram on that as well. Okay, so the next step that I wanted to talk to you guys about is what do you guys see as as the your biggest challenges on achieving this on this level? So. You know, we talk about the five levels and, and we can already see that we're going to start battling out here in terms of the company's data ecosystem. I think um, Zane made that, you know, in terms of going across all the data. So you may need to start within areas of data. So you can get maybe just a area, maybe a customer, for example, that may be tricky um, in terms of, of privacy and stuff like that. but you may need to choose a domain that you can that you can start in. So, any any feedback from you guys in terms of of what do you think the hardest action item is for you? I think you guys can see it whilst answering, if I'm correct, uh, the, and you can just toggle to see the the action items that are there. Hi, Howard. Yes. Uh, Dinao, yeah, I, I think from an MTN perspective, or let me just uh, jump into that one, because I think this teach people to ask the right questions is the main blocker okay. for us. Yeah, because right. it's, it's a matter, of, in our environment, it's a matter of you don't know what you don't know. And a lot right. of people are so reliant on IT to yes. answer questions. And because we've been saying we're doing things on a use case basis, so right. it's all, all our answers are use case based, but we, we find ourselves always having to rely on IT for a lot of things. And maybe I'm in a fortunate position because I moved from an IT role into a more business yes. role because now I'm part of a BICC, which is a competency center just right. for that. But you find that the business doesn't really know what questions to ask unless... Yes. IT says this is what's there, and we, we, that, that's where the blockers are. IT will just give them what they have. Right. So I, I, I like, I like. I'm glad you asked that question because it's one of the things that I, I've spent quite a bit of time looking at. Um, and so to give you a, a, a simple example, um, 
you know, sometimes the, the business restrict themselves to the what questions. And that's typically on, on, on the BI side. So what happened for this product in quarter one of 2020? Uh, and that's almost where we stop. But you've got to start showing them in terms of going to the why question. Why did that uh, happen in for that product in quarter 2021? So all of a sudden, the digging gets deeper. So they now have to explain the numbers. They have to explain what happened in, in relation to the other numbers. And then you can go up and, you know, those business questions that, that we've spoken about as you teach them how to go from the what to the why to the when will it happen to how can I affect it to happen and to what I don't know. So there's those business level questions that push people up. Um, but related to this is also the decision mandate. So if you have a report, if you have a data set that you're looking at, one should be able to tag this data set with what business context and what business decision does this data set link to and drive and potentially answer. And the nice thing about that is that if the data set is not giving you any answers, you probably understand my next statement as well. Maybe you should throw it away. Does that? True. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm fighting those <laughs> yeah. wars. Yeah. So, so it's this combination of teaching the right questions. Stop just asking what. Ask the why. Ask the, the when this is going to happen or what should I do to make it happen. Then all of a sudden, just going from what to why is a, is a massive jump. Um, in, in that situation in terms of getting them to look at the data that, that they need to ask. And then it's about saying, okay, what decisions do you guys need to make? And then how do we get from the data to making a decision? So what questions do we need to ask? And then what is the decision? And then what is the action, basically? Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Okay. Any any other comments on that? So, so Danea had uh, asked the right question. I like that. Ah, sorry. Ah, was that you, Danea, the first one? Teach people to ask the right question. Add business context there, yeah, right? Okay. Yeah. Map your, uh, conduct an assessment. Wow. Wow, is that from when you say conduct an assessment, the hardest one is that because people are a little bit uh, nervous of the results of the assessment? Yeah, I think so, Howard. This was mine. Okay. Some All of right. the discussions I've had in in my business development context, yeah. Okay. It's it's it might be um, it's that, hindering, that, that it hasn't that it hasn't happened yet um in in the in the business where i'm a, where, where, who i'm talking to in terms of 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 presenting the opportunity to assist with these assessments they mm. are shy potentially shy i don't know okay it's a, okay it's fine. great and then that minimize data extract so guys if you if you want to have a look at i mean i can we we should be coming out with a demo pretty soon for data warehousing on, on Snowflake in terms of minimizing data extracts. Um, what I'll do is, is if, if you would like, I can take you through how Snowflake does it. Um, so they build a bridge between the hybrid, between your local data set and the, and the cloud, and then they manage that ability to define data extracts uh, that don't really extract data. So it's a little bit like a data lake where you can um, put these extracts on top of the data for the different people, but it never moves. The data never moves from where it's at, and then it prevents people also from updating and, and stuff like that. So there, there's some really fancy technologies to help you do that. Um, and there was a good comment uh, when, I, when I was attending that CDO school where they basically said, Guys, get get some of these technologist companies to come in and, and demonstrate what's capable, what's possible, and it will give you some amazing ideas. And I, I certainly agree with that one. Is lean on the lean on the vendors. Now I know 
I mean, I know with some of the customers that you basically don't even get involved in a vendor discussion unless there's an RFP and, and stuff like that. So it's not as easy as that as, as what I've just mentioned, but uh, it is helpful to go to some of those exercises. All right, guys, I think that's sort of the end of the discussion today. Um, any comments, any feedback from you? I was just going to add uh, just on this last slide. Um, I also had, uh, <laughs> before Danae was speaking as well, looking at the teaching um, people to ask the right, right. questions for similar reasons in terms of, um, yeah, how do you help also people with that, like teaching those yeah. kind of critical skills um, that might be a little bit more abstract than having something that's like a concrete thing to follow. Um, yeah, so that was also one of mine. So I didn't put it in the box. But okay. Yeah. Okay. Those are my <laughs> yeah, that's it. It is it, it that uh, I agree with you, um, but I, I do like that thing of you know with the with the uh, Zachman framework, the five wives and the husband, um, the what, where, when, why, how, uh, and who. So if if you can just walk them through the context of getting past the what question, um, all of a sudden things come out. Uh, a lot more in terms of going through that. So it is about teaching them to ask more insightful questions and to get more out of the data than they're currently seeing. Yes, that's a good point. Thanks, Howard. Did you hear, I mean, I don't know if Zachman came out one day, it was really fortunate, he came out with Dama. he did a presentation at the Reserve Bank, and he said that this what, where, when, why, how, the five wives and husband is, has been used by the Indian uh, Bureau of Intelligence. I'm, I'm not sure what you call it. And, and they do this mapping of every single time they go into these investigations, they break it all down into these different levels. And then you know with Sachman is he has different levels of presentation. So what is presented at an executive level? It's almost an inventory list. Then what is presented at a management level? What is presented at an architect level? What is presented at a builder's level? And what is presented at an operational level? And you can then adjust these questions as you go. So helpful to use that in just determining and understanding decisions and issues that you're facing in the business. He, he applies that really well. Thanks, I'll look into that. Okay. Anything else, Andrea, all good from your side? Sorry, I was mute there. Yeah, all good, Howard. Thanks. This was okay. a good session. I, f I feel like I'm in a bit of a different space at the moment. So just sitting and listening to you talk and, and um, I feel like I'm ex being exposed to certain things that, that I'm currently not exposed to in my working space. So. So, yeah, you should have tried yeah. last night. At, we, we had one on ethics. Is that more? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, 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 I failed on that one badly. <laughs> <laughs> I feel I, I still struggle with having to sell data management and yeah. just data concepts to Exco and to yeah. executives. Yeah, so You're I find. Right always that that bit of a, a struggle and then i'm also finding that i'm not necessarily a salesperson i just want to like give me the money so that i can do it type of person so right yeah. right yeah so we yeah. we are putting uh, a course together for data management for executives where we we're trying to address this very thing you're talking about in terms of of how do we overcome the 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 blockage that that most of us are facing so that we get the right uh, representation. And the interesting thing that several people commented on this data literacy and, and they said, where do we start with this? And several people came up with the same answer saying, with the appointment of a CDO. And that for them represented the, the board's commitment to this exercise. And if we don't have that right level of commitment, we really suffer trying to convince and trying to push data management uphill instead of downhill. Um, and that was phenomenal. There was there was one lawyer that I met, and, and 
I, I, I thought this guy was pretty amazing. Um, he, he knew nothing about data management. And his comment was to me that he doesn't understand why the execs are not the authors of quality of data decision making and stuff like that. He said it always astounds him that when they go to court, then all of a sudden they get concerned about the quality of their decision making process. But up until then, they just they just ignore it. But the time comes when they made a bad decision, they're going to court. Now they bring the lawyers in to write everything that happened and why did it happen and prove that they did they took due diligence. But they what they don't understand is they're the ones who should prescribe quality in terms of data and decision making, but they never get it. Then this comes from a lawyer that spends his time helping people put legal law cases suits together. Yeah, it's yeah, it's, it's sometimes it's having the conversation about the various roles, like like a CDO driving data at that exco yeah. level, um, yeah. because I find sometimes as a like almost as a techie slash business person wanting to say to exco, for example, like you can't put BI on top of your operational system, you need a data warehouse. Like like I feel it's yeah, it's it's difficult conversations because it all involves it money and time. And you know, um, a, a slower, slower progression in terms of your data maturity than right. what the organisation thought that they were at. Um, so, the, uh, so yeah, the type, of, the type of approach that we're trying to take, and and maybe we will include you. We want to just run through this training, um, what we call a friendly training, where we you try to talk to the execs without mentioning all the data management terminology. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's yeah, yeah. It's because you're <laughs> selling a car without saying your tires is really shitty or your brakes is but, not working. But, but what what you can do, which is quite interesting. So there are two things. One guy taught me this lesson of he he works for a bus company, um, and he put a metaphor together to say. Uh, you guys think that brakes are to stop you, but brakes are to make you go faster. And he he demonstrated to them how with with the appropriate level of, of brakes on the buses and that they could actually go faster. Um, and and it was clever ways like that to to communicate with the execs, where all of a sudden the, the, they started to get the data jokes which for years they never got and they never understood. So it is it is sometimes uh, important to communicate at a level that they see the value and not you trying to teach them first and, and then they see the value. Yeah, Howard, I, I need that lesson. I, d I definitely do. I think we all do, <laughs> repeatedly. <laughs> I remember someone else coming to me and he said, Guys, when I get a, if I've got a hole in my house or I, I got a problem, I got damp in my problem, and I bring in an architect or an engineer, I I really I really don't want them to tell me about the electrician or the plumbing or the whatever it is. I just want this hole to go away. Hmm. But yeah, I really like the break analogy, Howard. I think I'm going to use yes. that. <laughs> yeah, it, it's. It's phenomenal, and and when you do some research in terms of how much it improves the Formula One cars, just the braking, what improvements it had in terms of their speed was phenomenal. Good guys, I think I'm I'm wasting a lot of your time. Thanks, cool. Howard. Really appreciate it. Thanks everybody for the Thanks, time and the, and the input. Thanks, was excellent. Man. Pleasure. Cheers. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Thanks guys. Yeah. Cheers, bye. Great. Bye. Thank you, Howard. Really appreciate the time. Yeah. Right, man. Bye. Bye.